All right. Um, I am Barry Loveland, an oral history interviewer with the LGBT Center of Central Pennsylvania History Project. And I'm here today with Lana Malmsheimer, who is our videographer. And today is October 10th, 2014. And we're here interviewing Sharon Mahar Potter uh, at the LGBT Center in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And first of all, do I have your permission to videotape the interview? Yes, you do. Okay, great. Um, and we have a consent form that I'm going to ask you to fill out or, or, or sign later, okay. uh, which will describe any way that you'd want to restrict anything, but it's up to you if you would want to restrict any okay. content, but you can decide that after the interview. Um, and uh, also let me assure you that any time during the interview, you may ask to take a break or turn the camera off and we can stop and take a break if you'd okay. like. Um, and you can decline to answer any question if you choose to, to do that. Um, so just let me know if, okay. if you need a break or anything. Okay. All right. Um, well, um, first of all, um, sorry. Uh, if you could um, maybe First of all, state your name and spell it for the record so that we have a, a, all that correct on the interview. Okay. It's Sharon Mar Potter, S-H-A-R-O-N-M-A-H-A-R-P-O-T-T-E-R. -E um, could you just tell a little bit about your um, background of where you were born, where you grew up, your family? Sure. I was actually born in Buffalo, New York, although my parents were from Scranton. And I moved to Scranton when I was two, raised there. I had a younger brother who has since passed away. Um, lived there, uh, met my, was married and divorced, and then married my second husband, Tom Potter, uh, when we had six children under nine. The youngest was two in Scranton, Pennsylvania. That was quite interesting. And then I, we both worked there for many years. And then I was offered a position in Harrisburg to build the early intervention system for little kids that have disabilities. And I, I took that position and I commuted twice a week between Harrisburg and Scranton. Lived with my friend Beth Bay, who was in the Casey administration cabinet. Um, not long after I was here and when our youngest child, oh, sorry, when our youngest child left and moved to California, my husband then took a position in Harrisburg as well with the Historic Museum Commission and worked with Barry Lovelin, who I got to know. Um, at one point, um, after the 18 months of working in early intervention, I was uh, appointed deputy director of the agency, so I, I stayed on. And in that capacity, I was testifying in front of the House Education Committee um, one time about outcomes-based education, uh, children with disabilities incorporated into the classrooms, regular classrooms, and the benefits of that. And I sat down, and a young man came to the microphone whose first name was Andy. He was in his early 20s, and he talked to the committee about his experiences in high school. He was a gay man who survived being beaten and harassed. He had two suicide attempts, and what he was asking them was, what are you doing now to protect kids who are in the schools? And they were kind of baffled. They weren't doing much of anything. I don't mean to say they didn't care. I think it wasn't on their radar. And it honestly wasn't on my radar either. Um, Tom and I always had gay lesbian friends, but I, my, war, my professional world wasn't focused on that at all. But when I heard this, this kid, I was very moved. So I called Barry, I called you, <laughs> and said, what can I do to help? And you said, will you start a group? And I said, yes. I mean, it was that brief of a conversation, I think. And so we talked about it, and I then called a woman I knew with the Harrisburg Patriot. Can't remember her name. I could remember it. Could find out. 
I told her what we were going to do, and she did an article and took a photograph. And we, you were, Barry, you were um, president of the switchboard, which was the phone in emergency or help me, I'm new in the area, I need to find whatever. Um, so we met on the lower level of Planned Parenthood, and the very first meeting, a couple things happened. First of all, I was nervous. Seven kids arrived, uh, one of whom was a young Asian man who had his head down the whole time, very shy. And at one point, he just looked up and said, what you're doing is a good thing. Put his head back down. He was very, very sweet. The other thing that happened right before the group, this man came bounding in, this handsome man in a bright blue ski jacket and graying hair. And it was Bob Cauldron, local pediatrician. And he said, this is a good thing that you're doing. And if I can help in any way, uh, let me know. And I did later ask him, and he was a, a really big help. And then off he went. Um, he did help in a big way. I don't mean to spring ahead here, but he came and spoke to the group several months later about developmental sexuality and when you come to terms with your orientation. And as he stopped right in the middle of his presentation and he said to the kids, I want to tell you how brave I think you are because you have courage that I didn't have at a young age and I could have spared someone I loved very much a lot of pain and that was my wife. And it was quite an emotional, emotional thing. And uh, I met his wife and his children many times, actually. But I thought that was pretty profound. The other thing that he did was he began to interview some of his, the kids who were aging out of the pediatric practice, going off to college or whatever. And he had a sort of an interview that he did with them. And one of the questions was, do you know your sexual orientation and are you comfortable with that? And if they knew it or they were struggling, he would say, well, you know, there's this group. <laughs> so we got a couple of referrals from, from Bob. So anyway, we started the group. Um, there were three of us in the beginning, and then there were, there were two of us, um, Melinda Aish, and I did it for a long time. And we had a wonderful time with those kids. We had funny times and heartbreaking times and everything in between. They were quite a group. They did pranks on us and all kinds of stuff. <coughs> when, the, uh, excuse me, when the group first started, what was the, the name of the group? Well, the kids named the group. We, we, had a, we just asked them, and they came up with it, and it was Bi Glia, and it stood for the Bi Gay Lesbian Youth Association of Harrisburg. But they used to call it, it was Biglia, but they also referred to it as Big Lia. You Big Lia. <laughs> and that was, that was pretty funny because many of them were lying. You know, they would tell their parents they were going to a dance or a movie or whatever it was, and, and they would come to group. I remember, I have many, many memories, but one young man who, who came in and he said, this is the third time that I was at the door. And if I didn't make myself come into the room tonight, I was going to go to the Forrester Street Bridge and jump in the river. And he came in in terrible pain, and he left laughing, and they went to, like, Friendly's or something, you know, to get ice cream. It was amazing. Because all they needed to do was feel they, they could be there, and it didn't matter. It was completely unconditional. And then there were other kids that were silly and teasing them, and not teasing them in a bad way, but, like, you think you have problems? Well, you hear my problems. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, it was being in the right place at the right time. There were some really incredible things that happened. My husband was very patient and funny. <laughs> I would call him I, countless times, and all I would say was, we're going to have a guest tonight. He, and he, I could just see him, like, rolling his eyes, okay. But it would mean that one of the kids during group um, would, because the first part of group was always a, a presentation or an activity. And then the second part was what's happening in your life, in school, with your family. Like if a kid was going to come out to their parents, we always wanted to know they could call us no matter what time it was. Um, and there were several times when kids were sleeping in their car, sleeping on somebody's sofa, they were homeless. So 
I would uh, bring them home. And, and we had a, a group of, we had, I think, six or seven families that were a safe house network that would take kids in at a moment's notice. Um, so that was good. And often they reconciled with their, with their families, but sometimes not. They made their own families then. <laughs> Do you have any uh, certain people that stand out in your mind as being, um, well, an example one way or the other, someone who really blossomed through the group or someone who struggled with his sexuality? Or... Oh my gosh, so many. Well, one, I'll tell you about the most recent because I was just a matron of honor in a wedding in Pittsburgh of Jonathan and Michael. And Jonathan was in one of the first groups. He was maybe 18 or 19 when I met him. And he, he was struggling. I mean, he's pretty feisty, so he was okay. But his, his parents were struggling. You know, parents, I think, I found for the most part, it's that they think they did something wrong or they think that if their child identifies as whatever it is, that means that somebody could hurt them because of that, that they have no control and they're scared to death. They, don't, they just don't know what to do. And I know John's mother and I know how much she loves him, but it was a hard time for him. And he actually became a facilitator um, for a while. He was a, one of the facilitators and now he's married to Michael and they're in Venice somewhere. <laughs> it was a, a fabulous wedding. But there, there are some, there was um, a young man, um, two stories that stand out. Um, there was a young man who was really, really struggling. Um, and he was, he was living with two men who provided a home for him, Thurman and Ed. And he attempted suicide. He ingested something. He was unconscious. They called the ambulance and they called me. And, um, I was all night in the emergency room with him, and there was a very mean nurse. I did not like her. She could have used some education around this issue, but he was in four-point restraint, and he was asking to be taken out of it, one arm. And she said something really mean, like, I will let you out when you, I, you can prove you can behave. Well, you know, he didn't want to behave. He wanted to die is what he wanted to do. And I had words with her, and she told me I should leave. I, had, I should leave, and I told her I wasn't leaving. And she said, you're not even family. You shouldn't even be here. And I said, then call security, because I'm not leaving. And besides, you need me here. And she, she was arrogant and said, why do I need you? And I said, because I'm the only one here that this young man trusts. That's why you need me. And she was like, oh, rolled her eyes. But he's doing really well. <laughs> he, too, now is married. and in his 40s, but that was, uh, that was a tough one. That was really tough. We had a couple of kids that attempted suicide, um, none successfully, which is good. And the other one, which is a funny story that I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the young men was in a psych inpatient unit and he ran away. And he called our house at like one o'clock in the morning he was at the Strawberry, which is a bar in downtown Harrisburg. I don't know if it's still there, but it was an interesting little bar, long, narrow bar. And he called me and said, I'm here and I, don't, I shouldn't be here. I need to go back. Will you come get me? So I got up and threw some jeans and a sweater on, and I had a very interesting coat. It's called an outback riding coat. It's very long and flowy, sort of. So I went down and I just opened the door and I went all the way to the back and there he was and he was okay and he was upset. But So I took his hand and we left and I took him back and he too is fine. But a few weeks later I was at a meeting and there was a man at the meeting that I knew slightly, didn't know him really well, but he said, can I ask you something? And I said, sure. And he said, about two weeks ago, did you come flying into the strawberry at one o'clock in the morning with a big coat on? I said, yeah, that was... <laughs> that was me. But there are things like that that are funny, but I mean, the agony that some of the kids go through is pretty, pretty wicked. And uh, it was great to have that group. It really was. It was terrific. At one point, we had six kids from Messiah. And that was got to be funny because a new kid would come and they would say, you? <laughs> You're here? You're here? Yeah, there were six from, from Messiah. 
and, and the changes, you know, we had, it was always changing. Kids go away to school and new kids come. And we had as few as six or seven and we had as many, as many as 20 at group. So it would vary and yeah, they were, they were a challenge. They were fun. We, we tried to come up with rules in the beginning and one of the rules was, which was so ridiculous, that we thought they shouldn't date each other because there would be too much drama. Well, w why else would they be there other than that it was a safe place? Of course they're going to date. And they did, and there was drama, and that's life. You know, it was fine. That, that, was, that was kind of funny. They like to tease about the rules we tried to, tried to set up. So that's a couple stories. There are many. Do you find uh, that the group changed a lot or course of the years that you were involved in it, in terms of what the, um, what the interests were of the, the kids coming in, or where they were in their sort of coming out process, or was it basically very similar, do you think? Well, I think as it, as it evolved, and at, because there was a group and there was more education, and that's when some of the allies groups started in the high schools. So, and we also started to do, we had a speaker's bureau and we went to high schools and churches. We went anywhere that anybody asked us to go. And that was, there were some funny stories there too. Um, but I think as people became, my teachers would say, well, a gay kid could come to me and tell me. And we'd say, well, how would they know that? And they'd say, well, because I'm open-minded. And I said, do you have a, a rainbow sticker or a triangle, like in the midst of all your other information, they would say, what is that? You know, well, you just put one up and you'll find out what that is because kids will come to you. They'll know that it's safe. But I think kids became more educated and, um, and helped each other and teachers became more educated. We, we had kids struggling with religion too. You know, a lot of them came from very religious families and one time we were speaking at a church and a woman said to me, um, what if a child comes from a religious family and they choose to be gay? Which we talked a little bit about that. Um, uh, they're not going to have their religion anymore. What do you tell them? And I said, well, I tell them that they should not be with a partner that's abusive and they shouldn't be in a religion that abuses them either. They should find one that doesn't. And she was kind of indignant about that, but that's the truth. I mean, you can't exist and sit in a congregation where people tell you you're bad because you're not bad. You know, it's, that's not, not okay. But a lot of the kids struggled with that. Um, and I think after we moved, we moved again, we moved to St. Michael's. And I don't know if Russ was there at the time, Russ Mueller. There was someone before him. But that was pretty extraordinary because that clergy person, that minister, priest, Lutheran minister, I guess, uh, would pop in on Friday nights just to see how the kids were doing and never, and invited them to come, but never said, you know, come, I'll save you. Or, well, that's silly, but, but it was unconditional. I also have a memory of that, a, a, a picture in my mind that was extraordinary. It was uh, the young man who, I first heard testify, and it was at a pride festival, and I was at the table um, with the kids. And this young man was in full regalia drag, and he had high heels and fishnet stockings and pink fluffy things and hair and lashes, and he was adorable, actually. And he came sauntering up, and I was standing with Russ Mueller, who had his collar on. He's a big man six foot two or three, blonde, Scandinavian guy. And, and as this person walked up, Russ just tapped her on the shoulder and said, and how are you today? That's all. But between the two of them, behind them, were the protesters with their signs. And I thought, oh, if I could have kept, I have captured it in my heart. But that would be quite a photograph of those people behind them that you know, that religious right that isn't either one, I don't think. Um, and Russ and that young, that young person. So, yeah, I think religion is something a lot, of the, they all, a lot of them struggle with, and I think they probably just move away from it unless they can get to a congregation that is welcoming. And there are many now, too, so that's, that's good. 
um, I, I, we always had more men than women, which was interesting to me. I don't know how that's changed, but we always seem to have more men than women. And I think in all my time there, we only had two young people that I think were transgender. And that may have changed too, because I think that to me now is the biggest challenge is that group of people that I think that's a really hard, hard struggle. Um, but those folks are more apt, I think, to come forward now with parents supporting them. I just read something like in Family Magazine or Woman's World or something. It was such an interesting place that was a young person who transitioned from female to male. And I thought, what better place than Family Circle Magazine? <laughs> it was just kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's anything. Um, I, a couple other things, can I tell you? Um, one day, uh, I was still um, Deputy Director of Pennsylvania Protection and Advocacy. I had an office off Front Street. And one of the young people, who was a very shy young man, came to my office, and, and it was my birthday, and he said, I don't have any money for a gift, but I want to do something. And he came inside my office and sang the most beautiful aria. And the, when after he sang and I opened the door, the whole office was outside applauding. It was beautiful. Harry, oh, Harry. Um, the other thing that happened was uh, a man came to my office, asked for me, I came out, he told me his name, which I recognized immediately because it was the last name of one of the young men in group. And I thought, I, well, I didn't know what to think, but it wasn't, it was not a comfortable situation because he was there to find something out and I wasn't about to reveal anything about this young man. So I um, first said to my boss, whose office was next to mine, um, kind of gave him a look like, beware or something, and I'm, gonna, I, I'm meeting with this man for a short period of time, and I'll be with you shortly, I think I said. So I went into my office, and he had a piece of paper with him that was the first name, last initial of everybody, including the facilitators, and our dates of birth. So he figured these are all young people, and these three people are adults. And he said, so I'm figuring that my son is in a group and that you're one of the adults that's doing something with them and I want to know what this is. And I said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I can't tell you that. But what do you think it is? And he said, I think my son is gay and I love him and I'm afraid. And I said, then you need to talk, you need, that's exactly what you need to tell your son, which he did. And, and that's all that needed to be said, you know. So he did, and then the son later came and said, I can't believe my dad went to your office. Oh my God, it's so crazy. But it was, it was pretty extraordinary that his father did that. I mean, he clearly cared about him and didn't know what to say or do. He just didn't know, you know? So that was uh, one of many, many interesting stories. Then there was another one. One of the facilitators, um, Melinda, as we pulled into the parking lot at Planned Parenthood about 20 minutes before the meeting, got stung by a bee, and she's allergic. So she was in her car, so I just slid her over on the, on the passenger side, and I drove her car, I don't know how many miles an hour, to the, must have been whatever the hospital is right there. And I mean, it was pretty scary. She was, it wasn't, it wasn't good. And so we're in the emergency room and a nurse came in <laughs> at one point and she said, there are about 10 very interesting young people out in the lobby. They all came to the emergency room. And so we could have had group right there in the emergency room, but they were all so worried about Melinda. And she was fine. She was fine. We called her husband, he came down and then I went back and got to the got to the group so that was that was good yeah we had we had really wonderful times and i i'm in touch with some of the some of the kids um the original group um through facebook and that's that's really nice and 
you know, one of them's a minister somewhere and several are married and in long-term relationships. One's running a personal care boarding home and one is teaching in San Francisco. And, you know, it's nice. It's nice, yeah, to be able to connect with them. How it's, many years were you uh, involved with the group? Oh, boy. Probably, probably 10, 8 to 10, I think. Because then I started graduate school, and that was, I had a lot, a lot. I was in, in Philadelphia weekends a lot. And, uh, and then other facilitators came on board. And yeah, so it was, it was probably a good, a good eight years, eight to 10 years. Yeah, and we had, to, we had talent shows, and we had one young man who had Asperger's, and he was, um, he was a big kid, big guy, handsome, big kid, like six foot three or something, and he knit. He was always knitting, he had this big long thing that he was knitting, and he was brilliant just brilliant. And his mother would drop him off and pick him up. And he would, you know, people with Asperger's have their, their social skills are sometimes a little off kilter. And, and his were, and he would say, you know, I really, I, I really like you, will you be my boyfriend? I mean, things that were just, you know, the other kids would go, oh, could you stop? So, you know, I, I talked to his mom about it a little bit, and what they decided was he would come to group and, and educate the group on Asperger's. So he did a little formal lecture about what it was like, and it, everything changed. He would say something, and they'd say, that is inappropriate. Think of another way to say that. <laughs> and they helped him, and he helped them. So that was, that was kind of fun. And I remember waiting with him for his mother to come, and he would describe the constellations that were incredible. And I know some of them, but he knew all of them. It was, he was brilliant. I'm not in touch with him. I'd like to know what happened to him. Very bright guy. The talent shows were always fun. <laughs> yeah, they were. <laughs> Some really talented kids. I, uh, I've written a children's book about a fairy that lived in my backyard. And it's not published yet, but one of the kids was an illustrator, Robert, who's now in DC and is a personal trainer. <laughs> but he's a magnificent artist. and. So eventually that will, that will get out there, I hope. Yeah, I don't, I don't know any other stories, but uh, I'm, well, I've, there are a million, but. Um, what, uh, what kind of programs um, do you recall offering like topics or I guess you brought in some speakers. Oh, we did, yeah. What sorts of things well, we, heard? every once in a while, we tried to repeat it depending on the, you know, the the change in the composition of the group. We always did safe sex things. Um, and there was always something new going on around safe sex. And I, one of the things that jolted me about, about that, which just popped into my head, was that there were the, the, this whole thing called gift givers and bug chasers. We we're like, what? And it's young people who feel it's almost, it's so bizarre, and I hope it's changed, but it's young people who want to become HIV positive, so they feel like they're part of the community. And they will, they are the bug chasers, they're trying to find someone who will give them the gift, which was like, what are you talking about? That was terrifying, um, but it was good for us to know that because we could pass it on to schools that were educating kids. That was, that was pretty scary. So we always did, you know, good sex education and boundaries and relationship stuff. Um, one of the things that we recommended, I'm jumping off topic a little bit here, but one of the things that I think is a problem when you have facilitators and young people is facilitators need to be able to set boundaries with the kids because it can be problematic. Um, kids who are just coming out all, they come so out so fast, so far, it's like the swing of the pendulum. You know, like they come in and they're scared and whatever. And then next week they've got, you know, like purple hair and they've got, you know, rainbow flags and they're just, you know, they just crack me up, they're so funny. But they also can uh, fall in love and be sexually aggressive toward the facilitators. And you have to know how to deal with that. Um, and that's, we recommended that as, as part of the training. And I think that's really, really, really important. 
But we also had, um, you know, we had things about how they could handle stuff in school and, and how to tell your parents you're coming out. You know, just start on a little low level. Hey, what do you think about Ellen? You know, <laughs> something that's simple that was inter a, a little introduction. Um, things about, um, you know, relationships. We, we did some stuff about religion, too, and different religions and how they approached you know, accepting people that were, were different. Um, we had a lot, and then we had, you know, as I said, Bob Cauldron talked about sexuality from sort of a clinical point of view. I also had a, deal, a dear friend who was a transgender man but never did transition, uh, and he came down from the Scranton area and spoke to the kids and he just had a blast talking to them. He since has, has passed on, but he just felt the same way I think that Bob did, that he, if he had been younger, if he had been born at that time, he would have had a very different life. Um, he would have been more blended with who he was, but he couldn't do that where he was teaching and living. So, um, But the, the, I mean, it could have been, we had speakers and then we also had activities. You know, we would have, games and all kinds of things. But the, the second part of it, I think, for me was the... And we would also ask the kids, what do you want to know? What do you need to learn? And then we'd get someone to address that. But it was the talking about the nitty-gritty stuff, that what happened in school. And we would go into the schools. If there was a kid that was being harassed, one of us would be in that school within a couple days. And often the solution was... Well, not often, but one of the solutions was... They had a, um, they accompanied this particular kid from one class, to, they assigned someone to walk with the kid from one class to another, which infuriated me. I mean, that's, how about calling an assembly and saying, under no circumstances is this going to happen in our school, and if you do it, you're out of here, period, that's it. Not like guide the kid to class, that was ridiculous. And then we had, you know, some, principals who kind of dug their heels in and said, well, if they weren't so, didn't wear lipstick, then no, that's not okay, you know? And if you do wear lipstick and wear makeup and you're a guy, know that the impact of that, but if that's what you choose, that's what you choose and that's okay. But um, it's not okay for someone to hit you. And so we did a lot of, we did a lot of education. Um, and then, you know, you'd also have teachers who then would want to support the kids, but then sometimes they were, you know, gay, lesbian teachers, and they were kind of scared to say, I'll start an allies group, but then maybe I'll have to come out and, oh, dear, I could get fired, which you could, you could probably still can, I think, in, in some places. So that was, that was interesting. We did conferences. We, we were on, did workshops at conferences. We just had fun times, <laughs> lots of fun times. And then we, you know, then people would support us and invite us to picnics, and we went to people's homes, and there were campfires and stuff. We did have a, a kid with um, a physical disability that used a wheelchair when we were at Planned Parenthood, and he couldn't, of course, get down the stairs, so we used the freight elevator, which we weren't supposed to. Sorry, but we did. <laughs> We just couldn't get him down the stairs. And I think that's one of the reasons we were looking for another place, too, so he could get in. And, and we also had a young man who had some, I guess, mental health issues. I'm not really sure exactly what they were, but he came, he lived in a group home, and he came with a staff person that brought him to group. And that was really cool, too. And the kids were always so supportive of other kids that came. And, were new, and it was always funny to find out how they found us. That was really comical. I saw it in the paper, or my mother told me to come, or my teacher told me, or Dr. Cauldron told me to come, <laughs> or I think I maybe mentioned earlier the little cards that they left in bookstores. We had little cards that said what, what the group was and where it was and what time, and the kids would leave them like at borders or in libraries in next to books on LGBT issues. 
So that was fun. And then once, once or twice a year, we also had a, a group where the kids invited their parents to come. And that I thought was really awesome because one facilitator would be with the kids and another facilitator would be with the parents, but we also had someone from PFLAG come and talk about what their issues were. And then afterwards, we all would come together. And it was, that was pretty profound. I, I hope that still is happening because it was pretty, it was really good. You know, you'd have parents that felt like they were all alone and they'd done something wrong and they didn't. So that was a nice way for them to, and then they'd hook up with PFLAG and what could be better than that? Yeah. There was a, uh, a scholarship program. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, there was. Um, that I was really honored about that. And I also got the, the, uh, the Fab Award one year. It was wonderful. It's sitting on my mantle in, Har in uh, California. Um, yes, it was the Esch Powder Scholarship, named after Melinda Esch and me. And it was for a graduating senior. And, and I did have an issue with that one year. One guidance counselor one of our kids went to the guidance counselor to get the scholarship and it didn't they pulled it out they thought it was inappropriate well oh dear <laughs> so i went and met with the guidance counselor and she thought it was inappropriate so i found out when the next school board meeting was and i also called um, the lambda defense fund and spoke to somebody so i went got on the agenda I forget who the secretary of education, oh, not education, the superintendent was. She, was. she was there, and it was my turn to speak, and I thanked them for letting me be there, and I said um, that I was Sharon Potter, and there was a scholarship named after Melinda Aish and me for a graduating senior, LBGT, or an ally, and that it had been pulled, and I wondered if there was an explanation for that, because if there wasn't a good explanation, and if it wasn't resolved, by two, this was a, maybe a Thursday, by Tuesday of next week, then Wednesday of next week, the Lambda Defense Fund lawyer would be there. And it was back on Monday. <laughs> yeah, that was outrageous. That was outrageous. And I did meet a couple of the kids that got the scholarship. That was really nice. And it went on for a few years. I, it doesn't exist anymore, I'm sure. It doesn't, I don't know, but there should be some kind of scholarship. Maybe the Loveland Scholarship. That would be good. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was quite something. I'm trying to see if um, there was anything else that was fun. You know, they did have a night that they were a bad, they did a bad thing. Um, one, a couple of them came in, and I don't know if they were with, they dated each other, what, but they had a huge hickey on their neck. So I gave them a lecture as I would give my own kids, about branding and marking yourself and, you know, pride and, you know, and they were kind of giggling under their breath. The next week, they all gathered in the parking lot before they came down and they all gave each other hickeys. Yes, they did. Bad kids. Bad, bad, bad. It was pretty funny, though. Yeah. Yeah. There, every, I, I bumped into a kid once, and I don't even know who it was. And uh, I, met, I said this when I got the, uh, the award, the Fab Award. We were in a restaurant, and the, it was the, wait, the waiter. He was a waitstaff, and I don't think he came a lot. I mean, he looked familiar, but he was like grown up then. <laughs> and uh, he, he said, are you Sharon Potter? And I said, yes. And he said, you saved my life. And I, I, I was like, well, I didn't, and it was, it was the group that saved his life, but, and I don't even know his story, but he was in bad shape, and then he, he found the group, so. And a lot of those kids are connected, stay connected to each other. Joey, it was a delight. I get to see him once in a while. He has moved with his partner, Joey and David. They have a bed and breakfast now in Rehoboth. And that was one of those things that, you know, Joey was 18, maybe. And we were always concerned about older kids coming to group. And Joey met David, and he was older. And he was like, oh, you know, I'm worried about that. 
Well, they've been together for 20 years, so <laughs> that, was a, that was a good match. But we were always protective of that, too. We didn't want the younger kids to get, or any of the kids that were vulnerable to be taken advantage of, because they were needy, you know, and you have to just kind of watch that. We also had a young man who came to group once and told us that he'd been diagnosed uh, HIV positive, and he had to notify all his partners. And he said, that's a problem. And we said, why? And he said, I don't even know who they are. There are hundreds. No way to notify any of them. And that was pretty heartbreaking. Um, but that was another funny story, actually. He was homeless, then he got an apartment, but he had no furniture. So we had a sofa and we were giving it to him. So Tom rented a truck. God bless Tom. Rented a truck and he, we were going over and it was a second floor apartment. And the kid measured and yes, it will get in. We can get it in. Meanwhile, it started to snow. Anyway, we got over there and Tom and this young man carry this sofa up and no, it's not, it's not going in. So then they carry it back down. And then he says to Tom, there's a fire escape. There's a big window over the sink in the kitchen. And there's a fire escape. That might work. So Tom goes up the fire escape onto the roof and says, you know what? I think it will work. So in the snow, up they go, up the fireplace, onto the roof, through the window. And he had a place to sleep then. <laughs> yeah, he was, uh, that, was uh, that was really something. When, uh, when Tom died, one of the kids, Jonathan, whose wedding I was just in, said if a kid could choose a pair, a, a gay kid could choose a parent, it would be Tom Potter. And that was true. That was really true. He had many a kid in the house. Many a kid, including our six, but many others. I don't know if I have any other stories. Uh, well, we had one young man that lived with us that wouldn't leave. <laughs> yeah, that, that was trouble. Yeah. Um, he just, he had some mental health issues and he would um, leave maybe one or two in the morning and go out, get home at breakfast and sleep all day. And it, it, was, it was a problem. Um, and he said, you can't expect me to leave if I can't handle living on my own. It's like, whoa, okay, but it's not going to work here, you know? And he was with us a couple of months and we, it just wasn't working. And Tom talked to him and we did have another place. I think he went with Eva, a dime, I think. But there was, there was a house waiting for him or someone that Eva found that was waiting for him and had made a connection. So it wasn't that he was out, but that was, that was hard. I mean, it was it's very hard for me to tell someone that's in need that I'm not gonna help them. But there's a point where you're facilitating them in, um, that's not the right word I'm looking for, but you're contributing to their issues and that, that couldn't be. We then had, when we moved to um, St. Michael's, we had, when group got out, we had cars circling the loop to try to pick up kids. And some kids, I think, might have wanted to be picked up, but many of them didn't, and we were worried about that. So I went to the police and said that I, you know, I, I was worried, and they had a patrol car just on Friday nights around 10 o'clock, just drive around and to be sure everybody was okay and nobody was being harassed or anything. So that was, that was a little bit, that was scary, but you know, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty good. I mean, the, the suicides and the worry that they were gonna die was awful, that they, they were in pain. I mean, the one young man that has done ex in, incredibly well is Doi, um, young man who came from Vietnam and his father had died. He supported his mother and sister. He worked in a factory. I think he lived in the factory, frankly. He made enough money, brought them here, and missed school, so he was maybe 
16, he was in eighth grade or something, I don't, something silly, because he was so bright, and accelerated pretty quickly. He was tutoring students by the time he was a senior in high school, and his mother found out he was gay and threw him out of the house. And um, two wonderful women, Lucy and Kiz, um, I met, the, oh, that, I was, there was, something happened in Elizabethtown. There was one, there was this thing that happened with, I don't even remember, it was a policy issue with the school. A family is one man, one woman, and their natural born children or some absurd thing. So this alliance of people came together, adopted kids, foster kids, gay families, so there was, and I went down to, protest or do something. I also spoke at the memorial for Matthew Shepard, which was pretty profound. But anyway, I went down and I was sitting in the audience and the school board meeting was happening and they were saying silly things that were made no sense and I was like, whatever. And I heard these two women behind me and, and said, we got talking and they said, if ever we can help, we will. So when this happened with this young man who was sleeping in his car, I called them and we took him, he stayed with us that night and I took him over the next day and they walked him through their house, showed him the house and as we were leaving they handed him the key and he just started to cry and he said, you mean you accept me? And they said, yes. And he lived with them. His senior year of high school they took him to see colleges and he went to Temple and that's history. That's history now. He's a really he's a really good guy. Yeah, we did we did some good with those kids. It was that's a gift. I always say it's the second best thing I did in my life. The first one was marrying Tom and having the six kids. But the group was the second best thing for sure. But the Matthew Shepard thing, um, when he was killed, there was a vigil in that is it called the Veterans Field behind the Capitol building? It was there, and Ann Van Dyke from the Human Relations Commission was one of the speakers, and I was one of the speakers. There were five or six. And when I got up to the podium, what I could see in front of me was the dome of the Capitol with the, Miss, what's her name on top? Miss Liberty or Miss Justice or whatever, the gold lady that's all good up there. And I had, I had like little note cards that I was, going to say something. And I got up there and I looked down and there were the kids from group. Could have been any one of them that would have been, we'd be dead. So I don't even know what I said, but I didn't follow my notes. But that was, a, that was another moment that I wish I could have captured because it was the, the, where it ha the place where it happened in the Capitol under the dome pretty much. Um, and those, those beautiful kids. But yeah. That was, that was crazy. A lot of good came out of that. Good always comes out of those tragedies, most of the time. A learning experience. So, so since uh, finishing your association with the group and you've gone on to study uh, additional uh, coursework and then you've yeah. had a second career. And I did. California. I did. I went to graduate school, got a, a master's in human sexuality, and became the sexuality consultant for the Office of Developmental Programs for the state, and did a lot of training and education of, of, of staff around the state. I ran two training institutes. We trained about 80 people all over the state. We did a, I co-authored a best practice manual. Um, it was Good work. I love doing it. I did a practicum at Camp Hill Prison. And I remember coming home from a meeting with some um, advocates, disability rights advocates, and I came home one night to my husband and I said, oh, I just had the worst meeting with my colleagues. They're driving me crazy. I can't wait to get over to those sex offenders tomorrow. They're so nice. <laughs> and they were. They were. You know, they'd done bad things but they weren't bad people and you were trying to help them to use the good in themselves to, to not do any more bad. I loved working there and I helped to start a support group for gay men at Camp Hill Prison. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if it's still happening but 
that was pretty cool. That was really cool. And then I moved to California, and I'm looking to do more work there. I've done a workshop, and uh, my, my, so my two areas of expertise are disabilities, intellectual disabilities, well, really three, sex offenders, and LBGT issues. I'm also going to be doing some work with the Pacific Center in Berkeley. Um, I'm excited about that because I miss this world. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's good. It's good to be back. I'll have to come back every year. I'll have to come back for fab. That would be so nice. I'd like that. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you can think of that you wanted to add? Oh my gosh, no, I, I think what's happened here at the center is amazing. And I know that, you know, Louis was a little reluctant to take the position because he's so young. But look what he's done. He's remarkable. He really is. He's one of my favorite people. I just, uh, I love that it's here and that I feel I was part of it. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool, yeah. And I'll go see the History Project there. Yeah. The, I'm going to do that on Saturday. See if my dear sister-in-law would like to go with me. And Joshy, the young gay man in my life at the moment. <laughs> Expose him to some of his elders, although he considers himself totally mature. He talks about the kids. He's 24. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. My bet is just as soon as we turn this off, you're going to think of another story. Possibly. I did write. Um... Did anybody ever criticize you or the group its existence? Yes. Um, we had one infiltrator. Um, we had a man who looked a little bit older than the kids, but he could have been mid-twenties, and sometimes there was someone who was a little older, but they clearly needed support. But you just didn't want a 25-year-old in where there were 14-year-olds. It just didn't make a lot of sense. So this young man came, and, you know, we're talking about things, and then he said something like, I think that Jesus Christ Almighty, you know, would not want you to do this, and, you know, and you shouldn't be, it was... And, and what he had, well, I'll tell you what they did, those little naughty kids. <laughs> they, he told them that they should have spiritual orgasms. That's what they should do. They should, like, pray, and that and spiritual orgasms is what they should do and not be in touch with each other. And so we asked him to leave, and he left. But then the kids sat there and went, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. He's like, stop it. But so that was an interesting night. And yeah, I mean, there were always the protesters, you know, that you're going to go to hell. And, you know, at the, at the Pride Festivals, which I loved, I love that Ed Rendell rode in the car and went to the Pride Festivals, the governor. But um, it was hard to see those people. I, I know the folks that were trained to do the umbrellas and to stand, I know, what are they called? That silent witness that stand between the protesters and what's happening. I have a lot of patience, but I can't do it. They just make me so mad. I want to just smack them. I'm not a smacker, but I just, you know, I think about the pain that these kids have been through, and how dare they? How dare they? They have no idea what they're what they're doing, and so that was that was always hard to see them and try to ignore them. That was, that was hard. So I never was a silent witness. It's a good idea that they didn't give me the umbrella. <laughs> yeah. So talent shows and dances, that was fun too. And places opened up to us. I think Stallions gave us one night a month with no adults, just kid, no adults, no liquor. The kids could just go and dance and that was fun. Yeah, they had their own place to go. I, do, I should tell you that when I got the Fab Award, my mother came down. My two friends came from Scranton and brought my mother, who had been diagnosed um, with Alzheimer's. And as they're coming down, <laughs> my friend um, 
said to her, now, now June, do you know why you're going here? You might know this story. And she said, I, I think so. I think it's that Sharon has so many gay friends, they're giving her a prize. <laughs> <laughs> and Beth said, that's exactly right. <laughs> but that was, that was my mother's take on them. <laughs> but my mother had it, my mother was a beautician and her best friend was a man named Tommy. And he was a wonderful man and he was always in my life. He was her friend. I always knew him. So what was, wasn't unusual and anyway, it was, was what it was, but I thought that was funny. A prize. Like, and I think Tish, um, Fredericks, who I'm still in touch with, she roared laughing. She said, well, you didn't ever notice that person behind you with the, the clicker? 22, 23, <laughs> 104, 100. No, I never did. So. Oh my goodness. But I'm so delighted that there are three groups and, you know, the annual conference and there's so much happening here that, and there are groups for seniors and, you know, aging with pride and AA groups. You have an AA group and all kinds of stuff. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, people died. They jumped off the Forrester Street Bridge and they're not anymore because you're here. That's pretty wonderful. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you again. You're welcome.